I can see something happening in there. This is gonna take some work. Good morning everybody. Today we find ourselves in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and this is the first muffler man I have ever seen. Check this guy out. Now up until last year, he was actually armless until the owners of the May Cafe decided to fix him up. Now I couldn't find a whole lot about him online, and I especially couldn't find any videos about him on YouTube. So I thought since I was in the area, I'd check this guy out. And man, was it worth the trip down here. He actually is referred to to several different things, one being the lumberjack, and the locals actually refer to him as the mutant muffler man. Now this is on Route 66, and he's actually just off the highway, so it didn't actually take me that long to find him. So if you are in this side of town in Albuquerque, I highly suggest you stop by and check him out. And here's a pretty good shot of his backside there. Like I said, he is right over the May Cafe, Vietnamese cuisine restaurant. Very, very cool. Ah, that is very cool. Like I said, that is the first muffler man I've ever seen. I have never traveled down Route 66 myself. I really want to. Man, that is a cool, cool roadside attraction. The name of the game today is going to be exploring Albuquerque, New Mexico. I personally have never spent too much time here. I've only really driven through this area. And so there's a lot of really cool stuff that we can see today. And I might hang around for tomorrow too. I'm not quite sure, but let's explore Albuquerque, New Mexico. and stop two for today is going to be the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. Whenever I was looking for places here in New Mexico, this was actually one of the most awesome, coolest places that I found, and I actually cannot wait to check this place out. You have to give Einstein his own little area here, and you can find anything you want out here. From his personal history, he was born March 14th, 1879 in Germany, to lesser known facts. Einstein had a lifelong love for art and music. Once he stated, if I were not a physicist, I probably would be a musician. I actually did not know that, that's pretty cool. And then of course, she gotta give Marie Curie her own area too. And this is actually the exact same little thing here, personal history. Born November 7th, 1867 in Warsaw, Poland. And then Marie Curie, arguably best known for dying of radiation-induced leukemia, July 4th, 1934. It's gonna be a huge bummer to be discovering these amazing things and then your own discovery ends up actually killing you. Okay, so if you have ever played Fallout, you may know what the sound behind me is. This is an actual working Geiger counter. And you can see it's actually got radiated things passing by it. And the more it beeps, the more radiated things are. Now here they're calling it an electronic personal dose meter it says this credit card size device electronically measures the radiation rate in a person's immediate surroundings. Often used in nuclear research centers and laboratories, reprocessing plants and workspaces where radioactive sources are being handled. I've never actually seen one of these in person, so I'm actually really hyped to see this. This is awesome. And then here, they've actually got an entire case of different Geiger counters, survey meters. Oh man, this is really cool. Civil defense survey meter. This is amazing. Like I said, I'd never actually seen one of these before in real life, but I have played a lot of Fallout. <laughs> so this is right up my alley. Got an alpha counter here. This is actually 
the actual Geiger counter. Now I think this is like a Kleenex type situation where you just sort of call these Geiger counters, but they're not actually all Geiger counters. But I'm not actually too sure. But this is sort of what I think about when I hear the word Geiger counter. They're calling this a Geiger probe. Super cool. And here's some atomic gun toys from Japan. There was a time in history where we were actually really obsessed with getting nuclear energy all over the planet and working within everything. And so when you see stuff like this, it's just sort of an ode to that time. Again, if you've played Fallout, Fallout plays on this time period a lot and they kind of play it up a little bit more. Like here's a perfume bottle, atom bomb, and Fallout actually plays it up a bit more than we were actually obsessed with it, but it is still really cool to see all of this stuff in person. This is a Vigo Radium dispenser. And now what that means is they were basically water dispensers with a built-in radium source with charged water from radon. <laughs> that is crazy. All right, so this guy right here is called the Wilmshurst Static Machine. It says, as you push the button, the two disks of the machine turn in opposite directions and separate positive and negative electric charges. When the charges build up enough sparks, they discharge between the electrode points at the front of the machine. Okay, it's got a little button down here. Let's see if I can make this thing work. I need to do that again. So when I got this camera too close, whenever that was going off, it started wigging out and I had to actually restart the camera in order to get the touch screen to work again. That was, that really scared me for a second. You know, this is one of those things I don't realize how much I don't know about this stuff until I come to a museum like this and I'm just surrounded by stuff I didn't know. This place is amazing. And so you can kind of see what I was talking about earlier in pop culture with this sign. It says, since their dramatic debut in August of 1914, nuclear weapons have been a reoccurring motif in popular culture. Images of the apocalypse in fiction and film, comic books, art, music, and humor, especially during the Cold War years, have been so prevalent that this era is often referred to as the atomic age. American pop culture has a telling barometer of our current hopes, fears, and reactions to the major events of the day. And this is exactly what I was saying earlier. This is the era that fall out takes and just sort of amplifies. But you can see in some of the examples here exactly what they're talking about. It says by 1964 this culture of downplaying our fears was largely replaced by Americans becoming more openly critical of nuclear weapons and the government's handling of the Cold War. Hence the picture of Bob Dylan down here. Now here's a movie I didn't expect to see in here. This was one of my favorite movies growing up. Broken Arrow. Wow I haven't thought of that movie in a long time. He can't forget Homer as he does work at a nuclear plant as a safety inspector. Oh look, even Jimmy Neutron's getting in on the act. That makes sense. And how could you talk about nuclear energy and pop culture without mentioning the one, the only, back to the future. Oh. I don't know if everybody would agree with me here, but I think the coolest part of this DeLorean is that it's not actually been turned into a time machine. You don't actually see too many DeLoreans that have not been converted into time machines anymore. Flux capacitor, fluxing. This says time travel was the central theme to the Back to the Future movies. A modified DeLorean sports car was used as the time machine. Time travel was made possible by a device called the flux capacitor. The flux capacitor would activate once the car hit 88 miles an hour. The DeLorean was used as a time machine and is powered by electricity requiring 1.21 gigawatts to operate. The electricity was originally provided by a plutonium filled nuclear reactor installed inside of the DeLorean, which if you remember would have been right in the back back here. Very cool. You can really see how much they would have had to have got this thing <laughs> to turn it into a time machine, which actually gives me even more respect for the people that do turn these things 
into time machines because that has got to be just a ton of work. We're going back. <laughs> this is so cool. Okay, this thing just kicked on as I walked by it. Come on, kick on again. Okay, if I'm being honest, I had no real intention of pressing this until I saw the sign that said, disclaimer, please be aware this exhibit makes a loud noise and do not be alarmed. So now I have to find out what this does. When the button is pressed, the gases ignite and combine to form water. This releases enough heat energy to shoot the ping pong ball into the air. It says turn the crank till the gauge reaches 100 and the button lights up. Oh, I can see something happening in there. This is gonna take some work. Oh, the button's red. Oh, <laughs> that did make a loud noise. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of these, but this is called a pendulum snake. Pendulum motion is an interesting physics property. A pendulum has a period or the amount of time that it takes to swing back and forth. And the length, which is how long the distance is from a stationary point to the weight, which would be these here, makes them all swing in different times. So we'll just get this and we'll drop it. And then we'll all go in different, very cool. Notice that there are 10 pendulums. The length of each pendulum is different, but the weights or the bobs are all the same weight, but they all shake in different times. Now, although the material inside of these are not actually radioactive, this is an example of how they would get rid of radioactive material. So if you had a bunch of radioactive material here, they would be packed in drums and then disposed of in one of these giant drums behind me. This is when we start getting into all of the thermonuclear bombs. Whew, this thing is gigantic. AGM-69, short-range attack missiles and Mark 28 thermonuclear bomb in the bomb bay of B-52H. That is this guy. Like I said, as I turned the corner, definitely a different vibe than just telling us about electricity. Oh, let's look around in here. This is cool. It's only cool because all of these are not active. I'm not a fan of bombing people. I'm not a fan of violence, but the technology that went into creating all of this stuff, especially when it was created, was revolutionary. And when you see how big some of these are, I cannot help but be impressed. That's just wow. Like I said, when you take into account how old this stuff is, and when you really look at the mechanics that goes into this without computers and everything else, I just can't help but be impressed by that. Now this case is a great example of that. At the top it says, ensuring U.S. nuclear weapons are safe and secure. This, for instance, the T1539 controller was designed to check the coded switch and the locked slash unlocked status of nuclear weapons. This is all mechanical. Now, again, I am not pro-violence, but when I look at this stuff, strictly from a technological standpoint, this is amazing. Now here we start getting into the nuclear bombs of the sea. And if you notice the propellers on the back, this is designed to float through the water. This thing has gotta be seven or eight feet tall. Wow. 
Okay, so this sign is actually talking about how there are three different ways or the triad of delivering nuclear systems. It says the three legs are land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs, submarine launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs, and long-range bombers. Each leg of the triad has advantages and disadvantages as a deterrent. Now, I don't know about you, but this is exactly what I think of when I think of a giant nuclear bomb. I think these are actually the ones that are dropped out of bombers. And then right behind that, we have the long-ranged that can actually be launched from a specific area. You know, looking around here and seeing how many different ways we've created to throw bombs at each other makes me wonder why we can't figure out that many ways to talk to each other. And that may sound cheesy, but it's, it's genuinely what I'm thinking right now. Okay, so do you remember earlier I was talking about that movie Broken Arrow? Well, apparently Broken Arrow is a military code name for a nuclear weapon accident. Now, I haven't seen the movie Broken Arrow in many, many years, so I don't quite remember everything about it but any unexpected event involving the loss, destruction, or serious damage to nuclear warheads or their components resulting in an actual or potential hazard to life or property is considered a broken arrow. And you can see here, these would be considered a broken arrow just because they are damaged. And I would imagine that's why they're in a museum because they are no longer active and just completely destroyed. Okay, so this crazy looking ball here has a name of Gadget. It says Gadget was the code name given to the first atomic device tested. It was called a device because it was not yet a deployable weapon and words like atomic or bomb were avoided for security reasons. Due to the complicated design of the device, it was decided that a test would be necessary prior to deployment. Gadget was tested on July 16th, 1945. At the Trinity site here in New Mexico. Oh wow, that's pretty cool. Initial assembly took place at the George McDonald Ranch. For the test, Gadget was raised to the top of a 100-foot steel tower. Now, because of the lens I have on here, it's probably really difficult to tell how big this thing is, but this is gigantic. They've actually got a picture up here of it being raised to the top of the steel tower. Look at this. That is crazy. Trinity Test Site Tower. The tower with the Gadget on top stands in the middle of the Trinity Test Site. Wow, I'm not quite sure what would be accomplished just by swinging this thing back and forth, but can you imagine being one of the guys there testing it? How nerve wracking that must have been? I mean, really, this thing is probably, I don't know, I wanna say like five, six feet tall. Okay, so I know I keep referencing Fallout, but you can see here the Fat Man. This weapons casing is identical to that used for the Fat Man atomic bomb. On July 16th, 1945, the Fat Man prototype was tested in the New Mexico desert site code named Trinity. Same place as Gadget over there. And this thing is 10 feet tall, probably six feet wide. And again, if you've ever played Fallout, I apologize if you haven't because I'm making a lot of references to it here, but if you've ever played Fallout, in that game, there's a mini Fat Man that you can shoot out of a launcher off your shoulder. This thing would not be possible to do that as it weighs probably thousands of pounds. Now this is only the casing and there's no actual warhead inside, obviously, because that would be extraordinarily dangerous. But man, that is crazy. What I'm finding out here that I didn't actually know is there's been a ton of nuclear testing here in New Mexico. Now, admittedly, I don't really know too much about New Mexico history because I've never spent a ton of time here, but seeing all of this stuff makes me really want to learn more because I'm actually really fascinated with this era. And so it's, this is actually really cool to see all this stuff. 
And now right next to Fat Man over here, we've got Little Boy. It says, this is a weapon casing identical to that used for the Little Boy atomic bomb, which was actually the first nuclear weapon applied to warfare. Now this thing is probably 10 feet tall. It's very long. It's not as wide as Fat Man over there, which you can see how it got its name, especially when you compare it to Little Boy here. But Little Boy exploded approximately 1,800 feet over Hiroshima, Japan in the morning of August 6th, 1945. So this is the bomb that we dropped over Hiroshima. Wow. It's hard to imagine this little guy here can cause so much devastation. Said so the estimated deaths were between 70,000 and 130,000. Wow. All right, so this is actually called Trinitite. It says intense heat from the first atomic explosion created a fireball that fused desert sand into this green glass-like solid. The bomb crater measured nearly 2,400 feet across and was 10 feet deep in some places. That's... I was raised in a naval family, and so I've been around stuff like this pretty much my whole life, but it never ceases to amaze me how large and how much technology goes into stuff like this. All right, so this is a TA-7C Courser II. There's a helicopter around here somewhere. Try to ignore the helicopter in the background there, but you can see here some of the specs. The wingspan is 38 feet, the width is 23 feet, and the height is 16 feet. The empty weight is 19,127 pounds. It's got a 1,231 mile range on it. The maximum takeoff weight is 41,000 pounds, and the maximum speed is 690 miles an hour. You know, for lack of a better term here, this thing is a beast. You can see in the backpack here that they've covered the blast area for obvious reasons. They don't want people putting things, including themselves, in the backpack there. But uh, this thing is just gigantic. Now it says this one is from the New Mexico Air Guard, the Tacos was activated July 7th, 1947 as the 188th Fighter Bomber Squadron. You can see here some really, really cool artwork on the back of it. This is sort of the kind of thing I think about whenever I see bomber planes, like really cool artwork on the tail. You can see it's got the taco name on it there. This thing is huge. There's just so many bombers here. I'd like to go through them all one by one, but that would take all day. All right, so it says this big guy is an F-105D Thunder Chief. And when I think Air Force, this is sort of the type of plane I think. This thing is awesome looking. Now, I'm not one of those guys that knows a ton about planes, especially bomber planes or any of that stuff. But again, I can really appreciate the technology that went into all of this stuff. And it just blows my mind. People made this. People, people made this with their brains and their hands. And it just, yeah, it's so crazy. Okay, so if you recall earlier, I was talking about codename Gadget, and I was saying how they were hanging Gadget from a giant steel tower, and this is a recreation of that tower. Now, this, again, is a recreation because I think Gadget was much bigger, unless that just looks a lot smaller than the Gadget that we saw inside earlier, but this really gets your imagination going as to what it would have been like to stand at the base of this thing and test something you had no idea how it was gonna go. That is just crazy. You know, this is kind of a sobering moment for me. There are a lot of machines here 
that have done or their types do a lot of damage. And I'm kind of torn on how I feel about it because on one hand, like I've been saying, the technology that goes into it is actually really cool. But on the other hand, their whole specific design and purpose is to hurt people. And I just don't know how to feel about this stuff. It's really cool and really impressive when you see giant massive planes like this, but you, know, you can see a bomb here too. It's confusing for me on how I should be feeling about this. There are a lot of veterans and stuff walking around here. Um, and you know, a lot of them are talking about how they used to run this kind of stuff. And, and if it weren't for them, the United States may not actually be where it is today. But hindsight is 2020, right? And a lot of people were hurt in the process. And so it's, it's impressive, but you also have to go at this with quite a bit of respect because, <sighs> wow. All right. This was a good time, but it was um, very sobering. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and call the vlog there for today. We got to see a lot of really cool stuff in Albuquerque today, and I'm and I'm actually really hyped on how today went. So I really appreciate you guys watching, and I will see you in a few days with another vlog. Mike Finder out. See you.